off when I'm doing. I don't know. Should be able to hear us now, which is exciting. Got those slow jams. It's a good one. Makes me excited every week. I like this one. This is fun. So, because then you know it's about to begin, right? So, welcome everyone. It's Wednesday again. It just just like that. I feel like we're yeah. back at it. Um, I can't believe how fast the winners go now with all these projects we got going on. As usual, everyone out there, if you wouldn't mind letting us know down in the comment section below, you can hear us, you can see us, all that fun stuff, and then uh, we will introduce our special guest. But first, I'd like to introduce my co-host. Hey, everybody. Joe King. How's it going? Also known as... (laughs) See... See, I'm judging by his reaction if I want to tell him that or not. That's up to you. There was a dramatic pause, so. The the ball's in your court. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, He's no around here as the mongoose once in a while. It's it's kind of his alter ego, like get pumped up ego. Yep. So I figured we needed a hype man today since Brian is in Cuba. So um, haven't heard news on that front, whether he's he's gotten that... uh, what uh that really tough permit yeah although i did see somebody somebody got a grand slam while they were down there really? so That's yeah great. all in one day uh i think tim got a uh what is it tarpon bonefish and permit wow which is pretty cool it was a, a cool really day, be. beautiful permit that so would be amazing um i think this is probably a good time to introduce our guest tonight which is none other than kevin feenstra really excited we thought this was going to be a uh an over the over the skype thing <laughs> this is the redemption tour uh kevin and i were unfortunately laughing about last time it didn't go so well our internet cut out so mm-hmm. uh we're right here uh we're tapped right into the main line <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, I was up on the pole today just wiring it in you know you know you gotta make sure everything's i don't know if that's how internet works i'm sorry sure. but I assume, I assume there's wires and, you know, I don't see the charger Splice guys it usually. Off the main one. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Why not? If anyone's, from, I'm just kidding. Um, no one come and arrest <laughs> me and check our internet connection. Um, that you get a felony. Kevin's on his way up to the UP chasing some raptors, yep. which is pretty cool. Just, uh, my boat's getting some work done and my truck needs some work <laughs> done. So I'm, uh, just heading up north for a day to... Just photograph some raptors. Just, I'm a little weird like that. So, what is your? So you showed me some pictures. Your your bumper had an un, unfortunate <laughs> uh, issue. What is your repair fabric of choice? Are you a duct tape man? Uh, bungees. Bungees. And, uh, okay. So the background is, and it's a little bit embarrassing, but. I'm guided through the first week of January, and then I had a break in my schedule. I guided through uh, last week, Tuesday, and it was a successful day. We got done. I was feeling pretty good about myself, and I uh, pulled the boat out of the boat launch, and lo and behold, my bumper cracked off with a boat on it. So um, so that was kind of a downer, <laughs> and I had to call another guide to perform a rescue mission and tow my boat home, and... Uh, so I can't tow a boat this week, so kind of my normal fishing routine was a little bit out of the question. So I decided I'd just go on a little, do a little photography because um, since I uh, zip tied up the bumper, it's good to go. So uh, anyway, so uh, I thought I'd come up here and then go do a little, um, just a little photography. So um, that's the story. So, Well, I think it, it works out pretty well for us. Yeah. Honestly, uh, great. Joe is an enormous. I won't even show you how many yeah. questions are on the other side. Here. This <laughs> oh, is, I don't know what's on this side. It's just a general notebook, but I figured I, I needed to have one. because. Well, there's some knowledge I'm sure just, about to be yeah, dropped. Uh, I think we're tying gobies tonight. Is that is that right? Gobies. Um, I did have that question. Mm-hmm. So There's something that's on the menu for the fish in my neck of the woods and probably most of the bigger rivers that are connected, uh, every day of the year you could use a goby these days. And um, so I'm going to show you three different patterns that take you through the whole year. Um, they're generally pretty simple patterns, craft fur type patterns. 
Um, a lot of times I'll articulate them, especially when I'm just going out trying to find a, you know, a big pike or something. So, uh, so I'll show you a few different ways to tie them and, uh, and, uh, let me know if you have any questions and I'll try to, uh, answer them. I might throw in a dad joke or something, uh, just to keep everybody excited about things and, um, we'll go from there. So, uh, perfect. Before we get too much further, uh, check out some of the links in our in our little area down below use that comment sections um kevin is one of the best at answering questions he's he's way too generous with his information usually i find <laughs> <laughs> i don't mean that in a bad way that's a weird compliment i know it's it's a i mean it's it's a correct compliment yes yeah. i should have a copy of his book right here um it's a book you should own For we've sure. been talking about it. johnny ray's talked about it Everyone has talked about it. Do you want to talk about it for just a second? Um, so there is a link down there, so you can check it out to Kevin's website where you can buy it that's in our bio. Awesome. So, you know, I, uh, as many of you know, I got this photography hobby and I always wanted to write a book. And, um, you know, Steel Swinging Flies for Steelhead and has always been kind of my thing. And so I uh, started out to write kind of a general Steelhead book, but when I looked at the uh, what was out there, I decided I didn't really want to do something that had been done. So um, I used the uh, underwater photography and uh, came up with a book that's uh, about uh, steelhead patterns and fishing steelhead patterns that imitate bait fish. And um, it, it contains a lot of different bait fish, including uh, a good section on the gobies that I'm going to be tying tonight, although the patterns will be different that I'm showing you tonight. So... Um, and uh, so I would love to sell you a book if you guys don't already have it or uh, it might change your life. I don't know. So <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's definitely for me changed how I look at waterways of uh, being much more intentional about forage fish. Uh, even like lakes, you know, going through and like, ah, what's the survey say for my target species? Going back and seeing what's a primary forage and what's the best way to imitate it uh, instead of, you know. Just yeah, I... Um I honestly, until I started doing the underwater photography and doing a little snorkeling, I mean, honestly, when I started doing it to 10, 11 years ago, I didn't even know we had gobies in the Muskegon River. And the first time, I, because I fished a lot of sculpin patterns, my first goal was to get uh, photos of sculpins. And I would see what I thought was a sculpin, and I'd click a few photos, and I put it up on my laptop when I got home, and I'm like... That's not a sculpin, that's a goby, you know, <laughs> and, and there were thousands of gobies. So it turned out that probably a lot of the things that I was imitating was sculpins, although we have ample sculpin populations in most of our rivers, a lot of the fish were probably thinking those sculpin patterns were, were actually gobies, and that's, uh, so I thought I'd tie you some very practical things tonight that you can use. Um, I'm going to show you a goby that works for, uh, steelhead i'm going to show you a goby that works more for trout and smallmouth bass and i'm going to show you my big jumbo sized uh well, day i call it my day off goby because it's something i like to fish a lot it's just a big yellow um pattern that fish big fish especially northern pike like to eat and pike really do eat a lot of gobies so um, i know from the people that keep them that find a lot of gobies in their stomach so um Hmm. Yes, so it's Anyways. got it's got my my wheels turning here for <laughs> ideas. So <laughs> yep, pretty excited. Yeah. We're excited. Uh, take it away, Kevin. Uh, and uh, yeah, we may as well tie a fly since we're here. <laughs> so <laughs> again, use that. those comment the comment section below, and uh, we'll forward your questions right on to Kevin as we go forward. All right. So here I'm going to go. I'm going to tie. Uh, a handful of goby patterns. We'll see what I get through. There's going to be materials kind of flying everywhere, and um, it should be pretty glorious. So um, <laughs> I'm going to tie uh, some articulated flies. They're going to be kind of old-school articulated flies that have a couple hooks, um, but you could certainly tie them on the shanks that are available too if you wanted to do it that way. Uh, the first fly I'll tie, I'm going to first tie it just on a straight-shanked hook. Just a regular hook, and then I'm going to tie it articulated. And uh, this is the f for the first one I'm going to tie is going to be really big and colorful. It's the day off fly that I mentioned a minute ago that I would f you fish on my 
on my day off, if you ever look on, um, you know, a lot of times, like on my Instagram account, you'll see this giant yellow fly, and that's a lot of times this fly, it's just something I enjoy fishing for now, and I'm sure I'll move away from it, but for now it's kind of one of my favorites. So that's what I'm going to tie first. Um, let me know if you guys have any questions at all, whether they're related to this or um, if you want me to solve some of life's deepest questions, I can possibly do that too. So We did have a question already, uh, which feist that is. This is a Renzetti presentation, I believe a 4,000. Um, I've had. It doesn't thing. cost four thousand. Just no. to just to be clear <laughs> with everyone, <laughs> that's not what the numbers are for. It's, but. Old, it's quite old. It's been a great vice for me. It's uh, you know, as you heard from the story of my truck, I'm kind of hard on things, and so um, and this thing has really stood the test of time, and I really like things that stand the test of time, and that's why I use this vice because it's lasted forever. So. Kevin's, I've seen Kevin tie at least, I don't know, at shows, at our previous events, and this is the same vice. I, I can think back, you know, I can find pictures from probably six mm -hmm. years ago, and it's, it's the same one. Mm -hmm. And you tie a lot, Kevin. I so, do. You yeah. do. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, over the course of the year, a lot of flies. I still tie all my own flies for guiding, and so um, so that's uh, that's a lot of it. It just keeps me kind of nimble as far as I just feel like I'm kind of on top of things if I keep tweaking things and sometimes they get better and sometimes they don't so so uh, I'm going to start with a pretty big hook with this this is a 3 uh Daiichi 2461 um, but really any big kind of 3x longish type hook um, usually with gobies what you find because they have really big eyes and uh because of that, uh, they the fish tend to st strike them in the head. In fact, when I um, for a while there, I was putting these on f flies that had trailing hooks, and I was doing that because I was fishing this fly for bass with clients. But a lot of times, um, pike would strike it, and I'd lose the whole fly. And so, I was tying them with really heavy braid instead, and just putting the hook on the end of the braid. And the problem with that was, uh, although the fish didn't necessarily cut it off, they were always striking at the head of the fly anyways, and so I was actually missing uh, quite a few fish. So uh, in general, I use a pretty short, big hook at the front, and I'm going to use pretty heavy thread, uh, something 3 odd or the equivalent. And um, just like any uh, fly that you tie, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to lay a really nice foundation of thread here, okay? And I'm going to go all the way down the hook and all the way back up to the front, like so. Now uh, I'm going to take some bead chain. This is pretty big bead chain. Uh, again, gobies have really big eyes, uh, and they sit right on top of their head. They almost look like a, a toad or something like that. So um, I'm going to put these right at the front of the hook, and they're going to actually be in front of all the other materials because I want them to be really prominent. And uh, I want this fly to ride hook point down, uh, so I'm going to tie these underneath the hook, okay, like so. Uh, if you're tying, if you're tying this fly and you want it to last a long time, uh, what you would typically do is after you've lashed down these eyes with a figure eight, you'd use uh, some zappa gap on there or other um, super glue type material. And uh, a lot of times when I use Zappa Gap, I use the really thin stuff for this, although you have to be careful because it will uh, cause some problems if you put too much on and uh, your hands will start getting covered with ice stub and stuff and you look like kind of a modern-day Sasquatch. So, um, so anyhow, uh, <laughs> I have the eyes on there. That was kind of the roundabout way of um, doing things. And now what I'm going to recommend you do, if you can get a hold of it, is get this saltwater mylar. Um, this is called saltwater mirage, and it's pretty wide, and that's uh, something you can get at uh, the Northern Angler here or any other fly shop. I'm sure they could order it for you. But I'm going to kind of diverge, and I'm going to kind of break the rules of going to a fly shop, and that is if you buy an Easter basket and you fill it with this stuff... <laughs> Um, this is probably one of the few really cheap things you can buy 
You can buy a bag of this, and it'll probably last you half your lifetime, but I use it on so many things. Um, and I feel like I should put it in smaller packages and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyways, uh, when you lift it, it's this is kind of... Um, it's, it's pretty stiff and I use this for tails on so many things right now. A lot of the shiner patterns I use, um, I use this and, uh, but anyways, your fly will be perfectly effective if you use the, uh, the Mirage too. Um, but I just like this and what I tend to do with these big bait fish patterns is I cut it at an angle and, uh, I just leave it out the back of the fly. Okay. And because I'm just using one hook on this. I am going to just cover this with thread, and I'm going to leave that hanging back. And a lot of times, if I want to really bulk this fly out, I'll actually leave the back end of this piece of flash, and I'll cut that one at an angle, too. And uh, that's what we'll have, okay? We've got two uh, approximately three-inch long pieces of this uh, um, iridescent flash. Again, it looks kind of like this, but again, this is just perfectly fine as well. Um, but you'll you can see that this is quite wide and quite stiff and I kind of like it for its durability Especially with this fly because Mr. Pike is gonna come along and try to eat it even if I'm fishing it for smallmouth bass So after we're done with I will not to jump in on you after we're done with this episode Kevin's gonna record himself just crinkling materials for everyone <laughs> <laughs> what is, what is that where everybody loves <laughs> Um, oh, ASMR. I think that's it. Yeah. yeah. We don't want to say the wrong thing and yeah, have it be weird. But <laughs> I, that's why I led you to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Set me up. Sorry. But there's, I mean, Kevin is the master of materials and there's, he's always got something fun and new to play with. So that sound just <laughs> makes me happy because yep. it means things are going on hook. Yeah. Just exactly. <laughs> All right. Go ahead. Sorry. Yep. Um, so, guys, uh, what I'm going to use. For a lot of this fly, is I'm going to use two pieces of um, craft fur. And these are Hairline Extra Select. It's really the best craft fur I can find. Um, I'm not paid to say that in any way, but uh, I wish I was. Hint. Uh, anyways, uh, um, so I'm going to take a piece of this that's a little bit wider than a pencil for the tail, okay? And uh, this fly wouldn't, if you don't add the flash to this fly, it really wouldn't look like anything much so you really do need to add some flash to this pattern and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to lay this in there like so and uh, this isn't going to look like a uh, something out of the box at a good fly shop this is going to be kind of lumpy and that's that's kind of by design because the lumpy fly will actually move the fish will be able to feel it a little bit in the water and so this fly is going to be kind of Kind of lumpy like me, you know. So, <laughs> so um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some shrimp pink um, ice dub, and uh, what I'm going to do, you can you can dub ice dub so many different ways. You can dub it. My hands tend to always be dry, and because I'm not somebody that wants to spend a whole lot of time dubbing, what I typically do with this is I just I brought my thread up to a little ways behind the eyes. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go loosely around it, and then I'm going to go back to this part, and then I'm just going to take my thread and go right back up. And that's how we're going to bind it in. Again, it's kind of lumpy, and that's kind of how I roll with this. So, um, so that's what we have so far. And it's uh, what I'm going to do. We're going to use two really wide types of flashaboo. We're going to use saltwater copper flashaboo. And we're going to use gold lateral scale. Uh, but you could also use gold saltwater flashaboo. Would work just fine. I love lateral scale. Lateral scale It just scale rocks. catches yep. light in such a great way. And yep. you don't have to. It's one of those materials you can use too much of, in my mind. Yeah, I mean, you're right. Yep. Yep, you're totally right. So all I'm going to do uh, with this is I'm just going to take... Uh, some of the yellow, or I'm sorry, I'm going to take some of the copper flashaboo, the saltwater flashaboo, and we're just going to take two or three strands of it, okay? And we're going to cut it off pretty close to the end here, pretty close to where it meets the uh, card. And I'm going to make this, I'm going to look at it, I'm going to lay it along the hook, and I'm just going to put it halfway, half of its length. And, and all I'm going to do is just blast it down, and I'm going to just take it, 
and I'm going to kind of go around the eyes and fold it back over. Okay, so now we have a little bit of flash over and under. Okay, and you can see kind of what I'm doing here. It's nothing too uh, fancy. And uh, all I'm going to do now is I'm going to take um, this yellow. And uh, yellow and pink and orange is a winning combination for a lot of, of smallmouth flies. I find that during the heat of summer, I lean more towards the yellow. But then as we head into fall, uh, for whatever reason, they like the orange a little bit more. Um, fish are kind of funny. I don't know if it's just me or the fish, but um, like in the in the winter here, a lot of times I start leaning towards blue for this steelhead. It just seems like uh, with the seasons, the different fish have different color preferences. And uh, so that's kind of where I'm at. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to take some of this yellow craft fur and... Uh, and I'm going to cut a pretty big wad of this, like so, okay? And uh, maybe maybe I'm going to just double it up here, okay? Do you pull much of the, uh, the under fur out of there, Kevin, or do you it's like to use it? It's not a bad idea, but the thing of it is, I, I would actually, for this, I would actually prefer to pull some of the longer hairs out because okay. I'm going to use this almost like a fur here. I'm going to go around the fly, and then I'm just going to pull it down. And kind of just like you would do with the... Uh, Australian possum or something, I'm going to just give it a snip right there. Okay, so we got this pretty big bulky fly right now. And, uh, you know, you don't want this to be too dense at the front without having this flash coming back because the flash really kind of fills out the body of this fly. So, so we're going to do a couple things now. We're going to take a little bit of this uh, gold a lateral scale. We're going to give it a couple strands, okay? And I'm going to just lay this on top, okay? And with the gold, I'm just going to lay it on top, and then I'm going to take the remnant and just fold it back, because uh, for me, this would be the extent of how much of this I would use. I wouldn't go too much further than that, okay? So you can kind of see now, and that's going to lay loosely on there, and... Uh, and all we're going to do, if you're lucky, you've got a friend that shoots ducks. Um, I do. I've got a couple friends. <laughs> I love them. Um, but I they, have I have one, and I need more. So if I, you know, just, one friend or one friend that has ducks. <laughs> Burn, man! You got me. <laughs> Well, I think we'll just leave it at that. No, uh, <laughs> there's no coming back. There's no coming back. I'm your friend. So you've got you. at least one. You know. No, one that uh, – actually, I have a few guys that, that just drop off feathers that are pl fun to play with. And yeah. it's just – it is such a joy to have just a big bag of mallard to pick from. Yeah. Um, I think I, someone dropped off some hooded merganser to play with or something Ooh. like that. Or It was had a really pretty bronze – to it this fall. Um, yeah. I have a friend that like shoots that. mergansers, and he said you wrap them in bacon, and then you throw away the duck and eat the bacon. <laughs> 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 now, I don't know if that's true. I, I, Good yeah, to know. I don't know. I, 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 basically, his point was that they taste really bad. So, um, But maybe you just need to cook them in more bacon. I don't know. Well, I mean, how, how many years have we heard about, you know, carp or, you know, sure. tastes like nothing? And sure. let me tell you. My wife is the champion of spicing things. She'll make anything taste good. So it's really? maybe maybe we need to go shoot some ducks. I don't know. We'll we'll yeah. figure it out. That's we and we're officially off track. So. <laughs> <laughs> we digress. Just having fun. Um, so. so what I've done is I've looked for two kind of exaggerated mallard flank feathers. Okay, you want them to be kind of big. So a goby's got these big beady eyes, but he also has three big fins. It's kind of weird because. Most fish have two big pectoral fins, and then they have two underneath. A lot of a lot of these bottom dwelling bait fish, like a sculpin or a darter, they have two on the side and two. But a goby's got two big ones on the side, and a great just one great big one. And the one on the bottom acts almost like a suction cup. And you can see them doing these kind of Mission Impossible things where they go up the side of of a rock and then they go down and then they go down the other side. But we're only going to be concerned about the two big pectoral fins uh, because if I add the third fin, it'll actually rob some action away from the fly. So so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take my thread and we're going to 
bind this down like so, okay? And uh, the, what I've done is I've made it perpendicular to the fly. It's nothing super fancy here. Um, and uh, then I'm just going to take another pectoral fin, and I'm going to do the same thing on this side. And uh, that's kind of where we're at right now. It's just a very simple, um, very simple goby pattern. And if you started tying this, you'd find that these tie pretty quickly. Okay, and then uh, and then I would just finish it off. Usually, um, what I do with these is I either add a pink top to them, or I add a orange, or even a chartreuse works really well with this fly. So all I'm going to do is just take kind of the classic. You can take a pinch of ice dub. Um, another thing that works really good is laser dub, like Senior's laser dub here. If I wanted the fly to be just plain yellow, I'd do the laser dub, but I'll just add a, a little touch of color. And what I do is I kind of split the uprights with this. I go right between the two fins, and that way um, the fins stay splayed out to the side. I don't want to bind it down so that um, so that they don't. And so. We just have this really basic but really colorful um, goby, you know. Sometimes if I want to fish it specifically for pike, um, you know, right now this color would catch smallmouth and um, um, pike. <laughs> that, that P word. Uh, but, uh, but if I wanted it to specifically catch pike, I might just make that a really bright red on the top, and that pike always like yellow and red and yellow and pink, so these are good colors. And then I'm just gonna whip finish it. You usually I whip finish it behind the eyes, but you can do in front or behind. Um, behind makes it I think just a little more durable. Um, but chances are, if you don't use a steel leader, a big pike's gonna come along, and you're gonna think that you're you're uh, doing the right thing by not using big tippet, and uh, pike's gonna take it away and. You might as well not have used the glue at that point. So. Right. <laughs> well, we have a whole big list of questions here. Uh, let's see. Uh, Bart, uh, who I know, uh, is curious if you'll be at the Midwest show at all this year. I plan to be, yeah, uh, and I'll be doing programs there, and um, we'll be happy to um, answer any questions or sign a book, even if you didn't. Buy he said the me. book yeah. is fantastic, by the way. So <laughs> thank you. So if you didn't, and anybody that's watching this, even if you didn't buy a book from me, anytime you see me, I'm happy to to sign it for you. Certainly, I appreciate you buying it from any of this, these fine fly shops. So, and then Kevin, who was just uh, Kevin, Kevin has a question for Kevin. All Kevin right. was just in the other day. It's a really cool name. Uh, let's. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Let's see if I could just uh, work this down into simplicity here. What do you find? This is a little bit off topic for the for the fly, but what method do you like to use for tying in possum heads on flies like yours or some of Jeff Hubbard's flies where he uses kind of a big clump there yep. at the front? For a lot of my flies, it's always been a big clump with a loose wrap and then tightening. But I also tie quite a few flies that are just on the top. And uh, it just kind of varies. The, the big clump is great for a longer cast with the kind of a long sink tip or if you're fishing kind of slow water. But if you need the fly to get down, then that really, really bulky head is going to hurt a little bit. So in that case, I'd probably just use a clump on top, and I just hope that that's enough to give it enough of a sculpin or goby profile and still be able to sink the fly a little bit. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. That's great. Uh, Brad asks, what camera you're shooting on nowadays? Which is, <laughs> is funny. Uh, we were both uh, nerding out a little bit mm, yeah. before we got started here about cameras. So um, so for the underwater stuff, I use an Olympics, Olympus system um, just because it's com compact and easy to, and it has a really short focusing range with a lot of the lenses, which... When you're underwater taking pictures of macro things, I like that really close focus. In rivers, you only have a, you know, a lot of it's shooting in a couple feet of water. And so your working distance isn't always that great, so the smaller system helps with that. Although I do have underwater Sony stuff too. Um, 
for everything kind of above water, like for my um, wildlife Fiesta stuff, that's all uh, with a Sony. I use a Sony A9 uh, for that. Um, it's a very fast autofocusing, fun to shoot sort of thing. So, And if you haven't, this is a great lead way. If you guys have not checked out Kevin's Instagram. Holy moly. You should do it. Yeah. It's a treat. Uh, I believe you're just at Kevin Feenstra. Just Kevin Feenstra. It's just yeah. kind of a hobby site. Easy. It's <laughs> just a hobby. It's <laughs> the coyote pictures the other day were really cool. Thank you. I think maybe we may we may have to do a, a podcast just talking about um, wildlife photography and fishing photography with you. I um, would love to. Yeah. Glad and which is that. also a plug for us. We have an, a new podcast we just started Ooh. called Spooled. So Ooh. link down below, and then there will be a promo at the end here. So. Uh, I'm excited to have actually Joe and I and uh, Jake are going to record an episode yep. later this week. We tell some funny stories from this mm-hmm. past year, including how Paris Hilton came to the fly shop. Yes. So that's yep. uh, Is that real? Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Not just a cardboard cutout. Yeah. No kidding. Actually, speak. I wanted to get a cardboard cut out of Brian while he was gone. <laughs> <You should laughs> I have didn't one. have time. I ran out of time. <laughs> but all right. Just a, a few more questions before the next fly. Um, would you talk about how you like to fish this, actually? Sure. Um, um, that'd, be, that'd be great. Because of the way this fly is built, it suspends really well. Um, and I'll just uh, use really big bead chain eyes if I want to get it down. Uh, but in general, it's got big-ish bead chain eyes on its own. But if there's times that I don't want it to sink very much, and in that case, I'll use plastic chain. You know, uh, it's actually really easy to come by because craft stores sell it as... For weddings, they sell these big pearl ball plastic bead chain, which works great. Um, so it's all about how you want it to get down. But this is definitely a stripping fly. You strip, strip, pause. It's a long pause. Gobies can swim fast. Like a lot of bottom-dwelling fish, they swim really fast, but only over short distances. And they really, unlike a lot of their native fish, they really survive by mass reproduction. I mean, they... They're not the smartest fish. They sit right on top of rocks. Most of our native fish, like sculpins and darters, try really hard to blend in with the bottom. Um, but gobies are pretty much out there. And um, so you, if you present it well, the, there, a lot of the game fish will take it. And I can tell you that the brown trout eat a lot of gobies, um, certainly smallmouth and pike, as we discussed. But steelhead, um, lake run, any lake run fish will eat it. One of these patterns that I might get to today, uh, I've caught coho with, even though they don't they don't really eat gobies, but just the color combination uh, seems to do well. So um, you can catch a lot of different things. Just strip, strip, pause, but it's a long pause. And then it's really cool with pike because you can strip, strip, and then just let it sit, and the flash catches it like a parachute, and it flutters, and it flutters. And I love using flies that flutter because... Uh, especially on a bright sunny day, you see it sinking down and then it's gone. And usually that's a fish. So, um, what, uh, we did have a, a question from Dave, uh, what rod and line are you fishing this on right now? I mean, so, I know it, yeah. you just tied a fly that works for three different species or sure. four different species. So it's tough to, to maybe put a peg in that one, but yeah, I, uh, I'm typically in the heavier rod category. For my own personal fishing, I'd rather just have be over overgunned with it when it comes to this type of stuff. Um, so typically, it's a seven or eight weight. I usually use either um, Scott Sectors or I use Scott uh, Centrix or Radians. Uh, that's what I use during the summer months. Um, really good, but the Sectors a really nice rod for this sort of thing. So um, it's a, essentially a saltwater size fly, if not bigger. So it doesn't hurt to to use pretty big gear and um, our typical fish are nice, but we do have some pretty big pike around. So if I'm specifically after pike, I will typically use a seven or eight weight because it's always in the really timber strewn part of the river and um, you got to be able to yank it out. And although I haven't had a lot of success in the Muskegon, I know that I'm, I'm always preparing for the day that I catch a big muskie with it, you know, because they've been stocking, <laughs> Muskegon Lake, as well as the upper part of the Muskegon with muskies, and caught a couple, but it's uh, they're they're pretty scarce. And but one of the reasons I kind of shifted to these big flies on my day off is because I'm really hoping and trying to figure out uh, 
you know, the muskie program if they ever come into the lower part of the river, which so far they, they haven't come in any big numbers. So anyways, I'm going to move on. Uh, That's great. We can, we can move right on. Thank you so much for the questions, everyone. Keep them coming uh, and we'll keep shooting them over to Kevin. So mm -hmm. good question. This might be the best group of questions we've had <laughs> on one of these, which is fun. So guys, uh, I mentioned earlier that you could very easily uh, tie this fly on uh, articulated um, setup. Uh, I think I'll just quickly run through that with this fly and then I'll move on to another pattern. But I just want to show you how you can articulate a fly like this um, for quite easily. It's the exact same pattern, just uh, with some articulation. And uh, then I will uh, move on to at least one other pattern, maybe two if I don't ramble on too much. And uh, we'll go from there, okay? So I'm just going to kind of do a style of articulation that I've used for many years on flies from a lot of different sizes uh, and shapes, a lot of small steelhead stuff, a lot of big stuff. I'm just going to use a couple, a pair of a couple of hooks, um, but it works really good with this fly, and you can use some really big long hooks. Uh, for all practical purposes, though, the fish are going to hit this fly in the head, again, because of those big bead chain eyes. So... Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a big piece of that uh, uh, pearlescent flash. Again, it could be the cheapo stuff that I'm using, or it could be uh, the good stuff. Uh, either way, it works great. And uh, this is just one I folded over. I cut it at an angle so you can see when there's two pieces like that, it makes almost a fishtail. And I'm just going to cover that with thread. And... Uh, I'm going to take a little bit of this orange, as I mentioned before, and uh, I'm just going to bind it down right at the tail. This is everything in, in fast motion. I um, tried a, the first version. I slowed down, but this will be very similar fly to speed up the process of tying. I always carry the um, scissors on my hand. I uh, During the guide season, I just need sleep, so I try to tie everything as quickly as I can. And again, I'm just going to take... Um, some shrimp pink dubbing or pink. It can be any variety of pink. And I'm just going to go back and forward like so. Bind it down. Now at this point on this rear hook, I am just going to take some copper flashaboo, the saltwater copper. Looks like this. Good stuff. Um, it works great for any of the summer type species of fish. And, uh, I am going to just uh, bind that down and I'm going to fold it underneath like so. And there we have that part. And then I'm just going to add a little bit of yellow um, craft fur, just like we did in the previous version. And I'm going to bind it down. Okay. Now this takes a little longer in your tying. And so a lot of times if I'm just mass producing them, I'll just tie them like I tied the original pattern. And that works just fine. This just works a little bit better. Uh, so I've got this big chunk of flash. Basically, this fly on its own would probably catch um, fish. So uh, <laughs> it's kind of two in one. But all I'm going to do is I'm going to finish this off. Normally I'd put a little drop of Zappa Gap on this right now. And I'm going to just take a bigger hook or wider hook. It's actually shorter, but it's wider. This is a 2451. Yes, 2451, a Daiichi, okay? And I'm gonna take this and I'm just gonna put it in the vise. And a lot of this is gonna be kinda like what we just did, except um, to articulate in this way. And this is kinda one of the more you know, you could find flies 20 years ago that were articulated like this. It's just two hooks. Generally, if you articulate flies with two hooks, you want the front hook to be heavier and the back hook to be lighter, and that helps the fly to wiggle a little bit. If you make the back hook heavy, it's going to just sink and it's going to look really bad, and you'd have to strip it really fast to keep it attractive to the fish. So, so what we're going to do is just add the eyes like before, like so. And I'm going to take what what uh, what we need to take is this right here, one of the more common types of thing. I would actually recommend for a big pike fly 30 or 40 pound maxima. 
Uh, but this one is uh, 20, and 20 works just fine. If For most of the steelhead flies that I articulate, I use 20-pound maxima. Um, and all I'm going to do is I'm going to put this right behind the eyes, and the first wrap, I'm going to try to make that 20 pounds so that it kind of pops up a little bit, and that means that it's bound in there really tight. Okay, and what you would do, ideally, is you'd take some Zappa Gap or Super Glue, and you put a little drop right there, and that'll keep the fly from falling apart. And uh, then we'll just cover this, and uh, we're going to just go right through from the bottom, and we're going to put that right on our fly, like or on our hook, just like so. And again, I'm being pretty careful to keep that distance. You can see that that little loop of mono starts right at the bend of the hook. It goes through the eye, and then it comes right back through that same area. Okay. And all we're going to do is we're going to snip it. Again, we would like to have some glue on there, ideally. I didn't travel with it because bad things happen in my box with glue on the way to fly shops. <laughs> and it's, I mean, it's not warm out right now. Let's be honest. Uh, nope. You don't want to leave your glue out there probably or anything liquid. Right. I had a soda explode my car the other day. Mm. It's okay. It was water. It, was, it happens. It was like it's a okay. bubbly water thing. Yeah. So. It happens. Um, so what I'm going to do just because I have, this one's going to have four clumps of fur. So I'm just going to go orange again. It's going to give the fly kind of a little var variegated uh, color. And I'm just going to go right at that spot. And I'm going to go down. And I'm going to take my thread in front of it quite a ways. I'm going to leave a little gap there. Again, we like our flies nice and lumpy. And we're going to shroud that in some nice gold, uh, some nice gold lateral scale. It's very delicious stuff. And uh, we're just going to take that. I've got four strands here. And I'm just going to go and I'm going to cover it up. And this and this fly is going to have quite a bit. And again, we want this fly to flutter in the water. So um, that's what that's going to do. And we're going to take some yellow. And, uh, you know, I just really, this is just a fun fly to fish. And... Uh, now that yellow doesn't have enough fiber to it. And my yellow is starting to get a little bald here, but I still have enough. And I'm just going to cover that up like so. And I'm going to give it the two little wings that I showed you before. In this case, I'm going to make them pretty big wings. And they can be quite gigantic on this fly. The fish don't mind at all. In fact, the bigger the better. Um, these are warm water fish that we're fishing for and... Typically with things like smallmouth and pike, uh, they don't mind exaggerated features at all compared to a trout, which might um, prefer it to be a little bit more proportioned naturally. So um, so anyways, we got these big, big wings on here. And then we're just going to finish it off by giving it some pink on top, just like I did with the other one. And so we have two versions of this same fly that are delicious. So... Um, so anyways, I'm going to move on to another pattern if, uh, but I'm happy to take some questions if anybody has them. Kevin, I, I had a question for you. For, sure. You mentioned in the first time, uh, that like chartreuse, pink, red being common yep. colors. Yep. How do you, how do you make that decision? Is it watercolor? Just kind of what you feel in the morning? Yeah, chartreuse. If I'm specifically targeting smallmouth, the chartreuse is a really good, um, really good thing to have on the fly. They really love the chartreuse, chartreuse and pink is even better. So if you want to um, put a base of pink and then put a dot of chartreuse on it, ice dub's really nice because you can um, just add a dot. But you can see how exaggerated I made the fins on that one. And uh, it looks delicious. So, And just to revisit, uh, we did have a, a question about, you know, all the articulated flies today have beads to separate. Yes. You know, is the goal just... It certainly wouldn't hurt at all to use the bead to separate. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep, certainly. Yep. We had we did have someone say they love your no nonsense style of fly tying, <laughs> and I think that's that's well put. So uh, it's just um, survival, just me trying to get sleep at night and trying. You know, over the I've been this is twenty five years of guiding for me. Uh, yeah, and everything gets you know you see guides flies over time, and 
I think with almost all guides, they get kind of stripped down to what needs to be done to catch fish, and that's where I'm at. So um, they're not, probably not going to win a beauty contest, but uh, but they're good flies. So, uh, guys, I'm going to just kind of keep rolling along unless you have a question for me. Uh, I'm going to tie a really simple fly um, towards the end of summer. Uh, I, this is kind of the underbelly fly. It uh, imitates the belly of a, skull, or of a goby as it's going through the water. And towards the end of summer, for whatever reason, um, I'm still using crayfish patterns a bit, but our river is switching from warm to cold water fishing, and it's a lot of times kind of caught in a funk between the water's cold enough to catch trout, but they're not really, you're not really catching a lot of the big ones yet. And the smallmouth are kind of biting, but they're getting less active. So um, this is a fly that kind of bridges the gap between the smallmouth and the trout. I catch the smallmouth and the trout with this. Um, and I also occasionally catch other things because of its color combination. There's coho around at that time of the year, and I've caught coho with this fly. So just a very simple uh, goby-type fly. Um, if you're fishing in September, uh, certainly on the Muskegon, this is a fly that's worth tying, and it's extremely easy to tie, and a lot of the smallmouth flies are extremely easy. It's in the same kind of motif as what we just tied. It's going to have uh, some craft fur and a couple little beady eyes, and uh, but it'll be a considerably smaller pattern. Uh, I'm using a size 2 hook here, which is a 2461. Daiichi, it's a 3x long hook. Um, I keep thousands of these because I do use these for steelhead too. Um, if you've heard me talk before, I'll tell you every day that there's a difference once you slide past 3x long hooks. Like if you're using a 4x long hook, you're pretty much guaranteed that you'll start losing more fish. For every x bigger, the fish is going to be able to pry that hook free a little bit more easily. 3x is perfect. Fish don't seem to be able to throw that as easily. 2x might even be better. And if you can tie a fly with just 1x, you're probably golden. So, and sometimes I do tie this fly on a Daiichi 2450, which is, uh, you know, very, very short and wide. So, um, but again, this is very simple. Uh, it's going to have some of the components that we had from uh, the last thing. If you buy a bead chain. Um, do yourself a favor and get yourself either a pair of diagonal cutters or a really cheap pair of scissors. And I, electrician scissors are nice because they often have a notch that won't hurt the blade in them. So all I'm going to do is use that notch to cut a pair of beads. Um, so again, if you use your really nice loon scissors or Dr. Slicks and you cut a lot of bead chain with them, it's very short-lived with your expensive scissors. So... Um, and you'll be kind of hacking away at the thread uh, when you're trying to tie things, and it's not not nearly as fun. So that's a great tip. I mean, some materials will just eat your scissors, and yeah, I mean, I've been I've been campaigning for Doctor Slick to make their synthetic scissors with normal human sized loops. Yeah. Um, I wonder if they've ever thought they're indestructible, of putting... but the loops are not comfortable. Yeah. And those look pretty nice. If you're chopping nice through stuff. I, I wonder if they've ever thought of, do, do any of the loons have, uh, or Dr. Slicks have a notch like that? No, I, I could that see, nice. yeah, that'd be a, maybe you have your signature <laughs> scissors coming out, you know? I mean, that might be, uh, uh, we'll see what we can do to push that forward. I know a few people, so, and I have some <laughs> email addresses all. But, I mean, the prime scissor, which is loon is making, is their big material scissor. Yeah. I could totally see that with a notch in the back. Notch would be really nice. That'd be you know, smart. some electrician scissors have ways to cut them with this notch too, and I just wonder if they could. I don't know. They're the experts. I'm not. <laughs> we did so. have a uh, quick question. Let me see. Duh, duh, duh. Sorry, I lost my. Uh, do you just stick to the Muskegon for the most part, Kevin? For guiding purposes, I love to fish everywhere. Um, you know, when I before I had kids, I would travel all over and fish all over a lot, but. Um, I still feel really lucky in that I get to fish an awful lot, but it almost has to be local because I need to be around uh, for the family in the afternoon. So, um, so, uh, so uh, yeah, uh, right now I'm mostly on the Muskegon system. Uh, I fish the little Muskegon quite a bit. It runs through my backyard. Um, I fish a lot of the little tributaries to the Muskegon. 
Um, so yeah, it's, I'm largely on the Muskegon is this short answer, but, uh, there's a lot to the Muskegon. So, um, it's not a river you really get bored with. It's kind of like the Manistee. There's just a lot to it. So, uh, yep. I agree. It's, I, I love this about a lot of these Michigan rivers is there's, they're, they're not one dimensional, Really, yeah. you know, every, every month is different. Every season's different. You've got so many species to target. It's not, I mean, I remember living out West and it was, Hey, what are you fishing yeah. for next month? Trout. What are you fishing for after that? Trout. trout, trout. I mean, it's amazing fishing trout out West, but I don't know. I, I love that we can yeah. jump around between pike and bass and steelhead and salmon and I mean, drought, of course. And so fish the same stretch and hit a bunch of different species. Yeah. All year long. Yeah. I mean, I often tell people, you know, I mean, I get asked just like everybody else, what's, what's great about the Muskegon? And I say, well, you know, it's a Swiss army knife river. I mean, if you want to catch trout in the middle of the summer when it's cooking, you're not going to have good trout fishing. But yet if you come when the water's cool in the spring, it's a great trout fishery. And, you know, we go to the, through the warm water fishing, which is almost, automatic once the trout fishing shuts off and by the time that's done the migratory fish are coming in and it just all cycles over again and um kind of amazing you know i've been fishing every day of my life and i try not to well not every day of my life (laughs) more days than not probably certainly for a lot of years and you know i live in an area just like you guys up here that there's probably areas within 10 to 15 miles of my house that i've never fished before of different lakes and rivers and um so it never really needs to get boring i mean there's a lot to it so we're pretty blessed to have a lot of good fishing in our areas so it's one of my favorite things to tell people on the phone is you know it's not an on-demand trout fishery in michigan you kind of just what you said is you if you're a flexible angler you will never get bored in michigan yep you know you just have to adjust to what's happening yep and there's a lot of different things. I mean, this past year I was catching gar and um, oh, dogfish cool. and freshwater drum. You know, there's uh, just never-ending different things you can fish for. And all of our rivers, especially the big rivers that are somewhat warm and somewhat cold, they all have these really diverse habitats that you can just suddenly discover. There's a different type of fish sitting on the edge that's not out in the main current and... Um, there's just a lot to it. So I'm going to run through a really simple fly. I'll try to get through two more um, if I don't uh, digress too much. And <laughs> so uh, That's okay. That's what the, the replay's for. You know, okay. this goes up. If people can't stick around, we understand. You probably should stick around because you never know. But this will go up. I mean, even tonight, people will be able to watch the replay and retie along with you, which is great. So that's the advantage of having it on YouTube here. Yep. So take her away. Um, so this pattern is got a lot of kind of clouser components, but it's also very similar to what we just did. You know, you see with all three of these flies that this is just a successful profile that's kind of morphed through the seasons for the different types of fish. And I've had a lot of patterns like that. A lot of the shiner patterns I use started out as smallmouth flies, and then they morphed into a different color combination for the other species. So this is just another successful color combination for me. And I'm just going to run through it really, really quick. Uh, this one I'm going to run so that the hook r- rides up, the the uh, the bend rides up. So this fly will flip over. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to take this like so. And you'll see how quickly you can mass produce these. And what I really like about this color that I'm going to use, this peach, is that not only does it make a good underbelly of a bait fish, but when you're in a river that has a lot of crayfish in it, This also is a pretty good generic color for crayfish. And so these fish are probably eating this as a goby. It's meant to be a goby, but I'm sure there's some that see it going by and there's enough of a crayfish in it that it's just looks like good food. So I believe uh, that's, is that polar fiber? The grizzly is a pseudo hair. Pseudo hair. That's what it is. Yep. And this is the peach color, which I will say I was perusing through the hairline catalog they're minimizing the colors available, I think. So <laughs> maybe <laughs> well, not that you have, I, I don't think uh, 
Kevin's, Kevin's ever been told to stock up on stuff. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but well, I, I think I've I'm exhausted my supply of Australian possums, unfortunately. But but there's still more somewhere. So uh, <laughs> a whole colony I owned at one point. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I use two colors. This is tan. This is peach. Certainly, if they stopped making the bar kind, you could potentially take a sharpie and make bars on regular peach or orange. Um, the cinnamon color is very similar to this. Um, this is the orange, but um, but anyways, one way or another, you could get cra- a peach uh, craft fur. So uh, pseudo fur is very similar to your typical craft fur. It just happens to be um, it just happens to be a little finer, in my opinion. Before I get to that, though, I'm going to do what I did before, except I'm just going to put one strand of my uh, fancy stuff here my easter basket flash and uh, again you could certainly use any of the mirage family from uh hedron or uh the same company that makes flashaboo um they make a shorter version of mirage that's pretty wide and thick that would work just fine for a small fly like this so i added that as a tail i'm going to put this in over top of it as a tail i'm going to let it go right around it and I'm just going to wind that forward. I'm going to give it a nice body of uh, shrimp pink again here. And shrimp pink works great. You could also use orange or orange. <laughs> <laughs> I just took out some violence on that package. <laughs> uh, <laughs> because I want this fly to be a little, a little narrower, a little more trouty, if you will, or a little more natural, so this fly, unlike the other one, which I stripped and it had so much razzle-dazzle, um, this fly is going to be a little more sublime, so I want it to be a little bit more natural. And uh, you can fish this a couple of different ways. You can fish this on the strip with pauses. You could also fish this under a little bobber um, called the Holschlag Hop, named after Tim Holschlag. Uh, basically, you'd ca- throw that upstream and you'd give it a little twitch and a pause and uh, just let it rest, and this fly works just great underneath a little float. So uh, there's a couple ways of fishing this. So anyways, so I dubbed a pretty narrow body was the takeaway from that. And all I'm going to do is take another pinch of this stuff, and I'm going to take it and just we're just going to go underneath it, just like it was a, a Clouser-type fly. Okay, so we have that so far. And we're going to take a little bit more razzle-dazzle, not a lot this time. In this case, I have some uh, pearlescent mirage. And I'm just going to take two strands. And I'm going to let them, since this fly is going to flip over, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to tie these right underneath the fly. And they're going to just kind of dangle there, like so. And underneath, those are going to really move around almost like legs, okay? Now, I have a couple industrial-sized bags of... Oh, my gosh. Of, wow. uh, You're not kidding. Senyo... Um, Is that the know, laser or the... Laser dubbing. Uh, laser dub, wow. yeah. Yeah, so this is what they look like, okay? And for this fly, if I'm leaning more towards the smallmouth, I typically will use this lighter-colored tan okay and they have two varieties light tan and dark tan love both of them very very yep. good yeah and um if you ever have to sleep in your car they make a good pillow <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you stuff them into your jacket if you're cold mm, kind of right. thing yeah, maybe I didn't think of that but oh. that's that's good uh, be an expensive is, jacket you yeah, know <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but if you're caught on the river and you have some hooks and you uh, bobbin you can yeah, probably there you go fashion some kind of fly as long as you have a little bit of flash uh, so anyways, that's basically the fly. Very simple, um, but it is a very effective fly. Now, if you wanted, you could, like I said, you could use that light or the dark tan. Really easy to remember. Um, great colors. This dark tan is actually a pretty good substitute if you want a little easier sinking material for the flies that you use uh, Australian possum on. You can tie it in in a clump just like I did. And uh, it makes a nice sculpin head in general. And it sinks a little bit better, though it doesn't have quite the motion that uh, Australian possum would. So, okay. So that's kind of the uh, early fall version of this fly. 
Um, these are all from the same kind of template of things. And we're just going to whip finish. I use a whip finish. Never a bad idea to put a drop of glue on at this point to keep it all together. But again, this fly, because you're fishing this generally pretty deep, um, it probably does have a bit of a short lifespan to it, but you never know. So, all right, so goby number two pattern is done. Uh, any... Kicking them out. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, any questions? Am I good to go? Uh, how do you come up with the names for your flies, mm, Kevin? You know, <laughs> I have a list. Like if I, over the course I, of the year. So I'm, I'm like, not the only one so that yeah, keeps I, a list on his <laughs> phone for fly names. You know, whole, that'd be funny. I have a whole <laughs> list. I could read you the list, but you guys would probably be. I guarantee someone would steal them, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you can't do that. You can't yeah. reveal all the secrets. Yeah. Come on yeah. now. That's yep. <laughs> so anyways, this is just a really basic. Um, this is more of a natural pattern and catch a lot of trout with this. So um, it's a good pattern to have in your box. Pretty much, I would say, early spring and then it, through the fall, this is a good pattern to have. Um, and I've actually tied this on a shank and caught steelhead with it. Um, I've caught coho stripping it for smallmouth, so it's a, although it's a very natural fly, it definitely has something attractive about it that catches fish, so, all right, two down, one to go. Uh, I'm going to tie uh, one more, I think I'll uh, tie this as an articulated fly again, um, but it's again, it's pretty much very similar to this original fly, except this is a really um, good steelhead trout winter color combination. Uh, you can fish it stripped. It works really well on the swing. Um, so uh, I'm just going to go to it. Uh, I'm going to start with a little bit smaller hook than the first articulated one uh, that I used. This is uh, just a little bit smaller, size 2. Um, I'm going to put it in my vise. I really like those 2461s. Yep. Yeah. It's a great hook. It is a great hook for steelhead. If you're ever fishing these for steelhead, size 2 is as small as you want to go for any streamer type steelhead because a size 4 they can bend if you're swinging it. Uh, yeah, the wire lightens up lightens a lot. Up, it yep. seems to be a, a big step. Yep. I've found some folks that really like the 2461 have been playing with some of the MFC sure. vertical eye gallop hook what i don't know yeah. i don't think they have a number designation I think as long as you have a 3x long, slightly heavier wire yeah, on heavier that one. Yeah. wire is good yeah. there's a plus and a minus to heavier wire um if you're like me and you're a lot of times fishing 15 pound tippet for steelhead a size two i can sometimes bend out of a snag and at least i'll reuse it on my day off sort of thing you know <laughs> um I probably with a client i'd probably cut it off after it's gone soft because the last thing i want them to do is lose the one you know, but when you're running swung fly trips, it's always a low number thing, and you don't want to miss the opportunity that you have. So if a hook goes soft and you're swinging flies after you get a snag and you want to land your next fish, think about putting a new new fly on there. So, so here I go. Again, you'll see the similarities to this and the other two that I've tied. And, again, just a successful template for fishing Michigan waters here. I'm going to start. With this rear hook, um, all I've done is covered the hook with thread. What thread is that? This is just a 3 out thread. This is a Danville thread, but I okay. typically use Uni 3 out. This just happens sure. to be the 3 out that's traveling with me today. So Sure. Um, Another one I really like is that uh, Vivas 140. Yeah. It doesn't build up too much. You can really crank down on stuff without it being too thick. Yep. I, I like the lines that are heavy but not too thick. Yeah, like... Um, the three out uni is beautiful for me, but some of the big fly fibers I don't do as well, or the big fly threads I don't do as well with. But uh, so this is going to have a little less flash. This is a really natural goby pattern. Um, towards the end of winter, a lot of the gobies will start turning kind of a darker color, and uh, it's kind of like a real. They either turn a really jet inky black, or they'll turn a really dark olive. Uh, and the olive will start, if you look at one, it's kind of lighter at the back and it gets really dark towards the front. That's what this fly is going to imitate. It's going to be a really good um, good imitation of that uh, darker darker head on this fly. So all I'm going to do, real basic, uh, I'm going to tie a 
couple clumps of, uh, I've already added that little bit of flash, just like in the past, but I'm just going to tie a couple cl uh, clumps. If you guys are going to tie by one color of craft fur in your life, if you're gonna, <laughs> if you just want to choose one, and you go into your fly shop, gray olive catches just about any predator fish we have. Um, you can use it by itself, like what I'm going to be doing with this pattern. Um, you could also take it and you could add some of it. Like a lot of times, this first pattern I tied, I'll put a gray or gray olive section that'll give it kind of a fire tiger mm. look to it. Um, so it's it's just something that's naturally fish attractant. Um, I use it in things like sculpins and gobies. I use it in um, uh, shiner patterns. So, uh, and the other thing about it, I'll buy uh, the gray olive uh, marabou, um, which is another thing that you can get that's also equally effective uh, in different types of flies. So, gray olive fish like to eat. Um, I'm going to give it a little bit of a body here, um, something a little bit different. In the winter months, one of my favorite colors with these bait fish type flies is a lavender or a UV. Um, it's the same color, but they're called different things depending on what type of dubbing or fiber you're buying. So <laughs> this is a ripple ice fiber UV, UV blue. Fabulous stuff. If you buy one synthetic, this would also be something good to look at because it's really good during the winter months. Um, I find it a little bit friendlier to use. Yep. Than say ice wing, maybe not as I think so. Maybe yeah. as I I don't know. Do you like the motion of ice wing better? I don't. No, I, I mean, like this better. It doesn't foul on the hook. It uh, it's a little stiffer fiber. I can tie it over top of a hackle, for example, and it'll almost form a spay collar on a steelhead fly. So, um, just a really good material. Uh, this uh, UV ladder lavender ice stub. I'm just going to use for the body here. Um, you can tie it on a couple different ways. I've showed you a couple different ways where the first one I just tied a thick clump on and I went forward and back. The second fly I dubbed it with my fingers just like a regular dubbing. This one I'm just going to tie a couple clumps on like so. And, uh, you know, ice dub is really nice because you can do make a pretty sparse but uh, flowing body out of this stuff and just fold it back. There's different consistencies in ice dub. Uh, and you, you beat I, me to it. Yeah, I was just dubs, sitting here waiting to jump I, on that because there's. It's always been it's, kind of vexing because yeah. you buy ice dub For and sure. it's like, is this the real dubbing type of ice dub or is it the shredded type of ice dub? This is the shredded type. It's more of a fine wing type material. Um, and all I'm going to do is take a really sparse little bit. Of, uh, we may have to talk more about that in the future, but you know, there's, there's just like Kevin said, there's uh, at least two consistencies of yeah. ice dub, mm -hmm. and if you have questions about that, you can contact us at the shop. We're happy to help with that because, like you said, there's really fine, almost it's almost like they took ice wing and cut it, yeah. chopped it up, and it's really fine. Yeah. It's really well, nice. You can see here, and these steely. these two are really oh, good examples. Go. Yeah. Here is a regular ice stub. You can see it's really nice, pretty easy to dub between your fingers. Okay. And here is the, they're both called ice stub, but here's a gold that's basically a shredded metallic material. And it's more like a wing. So, um, so anyways, ice stub isn't necessarily ice Created dub. equal. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like where you buy a dyed hair's ear dubbing and they're all the same consistency. Ice stub has some differences. If you guys have a, a blender at home, a coffee um, blender. I do this all the time. I take it, a coffee ground blender. Um, I put some of this and some of this in there, and I blend them all together, and uh, it comes out as a really nice, smooth dubbing to use. Um, the coffee grinder, you know, I'm talking one of those little things, not a big thing. It's a little canister with a little top, and you just put a little bit in. But <laughs> Check your local Goodwill. It's a buy, yeah, buy, buy a cheap one before you try what I'm talking about. <laughs> 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 I wouldn't use your fancy cappuccino one for this. So, uh, so anyways, I'm just going to wind this off like so. We've got this ready to go. I'm going to take a another one of these 2451s that I used before, and I'm just going to go over top. 
we'll put that in the hook in the vise. That color scheme looks great. Yeah, I'd I'd eat it. Of course, I'm not really fussy. <laughs> <laughs> Spoken like a true guide. You know? <laughs> <It's just laughs> uh, this one I'm going to keep riding hook point down because it's got two hooks and things get wonky if you try to flip it over. And, you know, you're much better off if you want it to flip over using some other type of articulation in this one. So, so in order to keep it riding hook point down, I'm just going to put these eyes underneath like so. They're just hourglass glass wrapped in. Just like before, if you have a bottle of super glue, this is a good time uh, to add a little drop. And we're just going to use the same technique to join the two together, like so. And that's that 20 pound ultra 20 green, pound if ultra anyone's green, although, wondering. If you're using it specifically for bigger flies like this, uh, then I would use uh, 30 or 40 pound. Um, but. For a steelhead fly like this, it's really not necessary. The other thing about it is because we're really just using that rear hook for um, for the motion of it. Most of the fish are going to eat that front hook. They're going to get pegged. So if you feel like it, you're always welcome to either snip the back or you could always use a, a shank of some sort for that rear part, and that would work just fine too. And, of course, you could certainly put a bead behind That's it. something I've learned about. You know, especially with smallmouth, for example, is, you know, I've always, it, it looks funny to have this longer fly and a, just a short, you know, fairly short shank hook yeah. up at the front and you get them. Uh, yeah. It's not yeah. because they eat by the head. So, yep. and different fish eat things differently. You know, sure. your pike's going to eat different, you know, than your steelhead and your bass. And, you know, tune, tuning your your platform to that, can really pay off yes you know yep. i always for pike i like a, a hook point at the midpoint of the fly yep. almost always in case they come from yep. the side so yep. yep uh and the other thing is the more you exaggerate the eyes in a fly the more likely the fish is going to eat it at the front so mm -hmm. if you're using no eyes or more it's more sublime then you know it's a very good chance the fish might get hooked further back but if you're if you're really exaggerating those eyes, chances are the fish are going to try to kill the eyes because because they know if they hit something in the head, it's going to die. So, <laughs> do you find a difference in like how often you you get the eat uh, if you have eyes or not, or is it just a targeting thing? Um, th this type of fly, I would definitely get eat with the eyes. Um, okay. Yeah. Now that the uh, yellow version, which is more of an attractor fly, you could certainly do without the eyes. Um, I've even dressed that one with a popper head. <laughs> it works just fine. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. That'd be fun. <laughs> but uh, but this one, uh, and there's reasons for this too. You know, this is a deep water, middle of winter fly. It takes lots of different types of game fish, mostly the salmonids, but I've caught walleye and things like that with it too. So um, so anyways, it's in with this one, it's as much just to get it down as as anything else. So I'm going to add a little bit more gray olive to this. And then uh, we're going to use two clumps. We're going to take one first right here. And then I'm just going to move the thread forward. And I'm going to tie a second clump in. But before I do that, one other thing I like to add is this little more coarse ripple ice fiber. And I'm just going to add a little bit of this to the front. Like so. And I'm going to bind it down. And you can see how that's coming together. Looks nice. I'd... And all I'm going to do is take a second clump of that. It's going to be a bigger clump. It really depends. Again, you, the bulkier the fly, the harder it is to sink. So if your goal is to get it to sink, you really want to kind of parse it down a little bit. Like so. Like so. Um, and all I'm going to do now is I'm going to add the fins that we did in the previous version. And then I've just got a couple, couple last steps, and then we'll call this fly good. Um, what I'm going to do, if you can get it, I'm going to use some hen mallard for this one. It's a little more natural. Um, it's a flank feather just like the other, but it's, it's hen. And you can see how that's going to make two really nice pectoral fins. 
these really do give your fly a good kick in the water. Uh, if you're if you were to strip at all this, this fly would probably just be just as likely to swing as to strip. I'm sure it's more of a kick than just a palmered yep. mallard, you know, which yep. I yeah. I think is really prevalent in the in the Great Lakes Bay scene where sure. you get these really big mallard feathers and palmer, which I like to have it, you know, kind of that same orientation where it's pointed yep. out. Especially and, if you're tying anything sculpin or, you know, uh, some of it depends on the bait. You know, this is a pretty wide bait, so if you can get away with a kick, definitely do it. Um, if you're imitating a shiner or a fry or something, then by all means make it narrow. But uh, for this, we don't want that effect. So, um, so again, I'm just going to put these two on there. I just about tied a regular mallard flank on there. That was. I distracted you. That's my fault. <laughs> you know, I'm just. It's easy to do. It's shiny object. There's a few things on your table right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, guys, this is where we're at. We've got these two fins. Okay. Now, if we want to make, we're going to make this fly look really kind of cool yet. Yeah, we're going to, before we add the final dark head, we're going to take a, a little bit darker UV fiber. This is. Uh, dark olive, um, although it's very similar to the ripple fiber, but this is dark olive, creepy crawly. Creepy crawly, Ooh, yes. Yeah. Which only good. comes in three colors, but I feel like it was kind of a, a precursor to that ripple ice yeah, fiber and one of my favorite materials that no one really knows about. So, yeah, never never tried. It's a it's a crinkle fiber, a lot like that ripple ice fiber. Yep. So all I'm going to do is tie a little bit of that in. Okay. So now our fly is getting darker and darker as it goes forward. And all we're going to do now is I'm going to take some really dark um, iced up. This is Wicked Black. That, um, oh, fish food stuff. The, that works really good in this case, too. Um, but this Wicked Black is a great uh, material for this fly. I'm just going to tie that in. Like so, and now we have really, of, of the three flies, this is a really good one. Um, this works anytime. I mean, this really, in the summer, I use this fly for um, smallmouth. Interesting thing about this fly is I catch dogfish with this fly a lot. Mm. This is my number one dogfish fly in the Muskegon. We have a lot of times weeds right along the side of the river, and it's really slow water. And this is in the same stretches that have trout and uh sometimes you'll see a bubble come up in, the, in those weeds and that's a lot of times a dogfish and so i'll go over and because the water's clear i'll kind of look and if i see the dogfish you know dogfish are really hard to catch if you don't see them but if you see them they're really easy to catch because they don't really like to move very far so you can throw it in front of them and even if the fly gets caught on a rock or a weed they'll a lot of times eat it as long as it's close huh. in fact they're so dumb that even if you break your line <laughs> off on one and throw it back out there. Sometimes they'll eat. They're the only fish that I know of that huh. will do that with some regularity. So, um, <laughs> anyways, uh, <laughs> but what they'll do in the Muskegon, because those weeds are right on the side, and there's a ton of zebra mussels on the side, so as a result, you have a lot of mm. gobies there. And the, the uh, dogfish really love to eat gobies. And so um, so this is, if you're, if you're in an area that has... Uh, uh, gobies in it, and it has dogfish. I would definitely recommend throwing this. You know, they're also called bowfin. But, um, but anyways, whether you're fishing for dogfish or steelhead, um, <laughs> pretty good fly. So. <laughs> yeah, that looks like it catches yeah. a lot of fish. Yeah. So, uh, so there you have it. What I w I'll ask this. This is a question from a little bit earlier about. What method do you prefer to get these flies down? I, I mean, I tell everybody that that use that's getting into two handed fishing, you got to pick one method at a time and manipulate it. You know, whether it be a sinking head or what I usually recommend is the tip system, where you can really fine tune that, yep. or you can weight your flies. Yep. Um, but we did have a question about how you're getting these flies down to the right level. Is I was just curious if you're. Uh, if you're a tip guy or you've played with some of the sinking heads as well. So um, when I first started guiding swung fly trips, it was almost all teeny 200, teeny 300. Um, people don't realize how far our fly lines have come. They were really pretty bad for the Great Lakes uh, 20 years ago as far as steelhead stuff goes. 
Um, that's part of the reason why it took so long for the um, game to come along. When I first started running spay flights or spay rod trips, a lot of it was shooting heads, um, and they worked great. But uh, the actual, for example, like the wind cutter and those type of lines, they were really made for the out west or for Europe. Uh, they weren't made for fishing down, down and deep like we fish. So um, when the spay fishing really erupted was when we had easy-to-cast lines that could deliver really heavy tips, and hence those Skagit lines came along, and then the intermediate lines to some degree. I typically start out the fall until the water temperature gets to be about 40, 38 to 40, and during that period I'm using almost entirely long sink tips to do the the dirty work for me. Once the water gets colder than that, then I actually shorten the sink tips but use heavier flies through the winter because that just allows me to, I can park the boat on a really fast piece of water, cast into the slower water, and I'll just lower the fly rod down so that the fly line hits the faster water, and what that does is it tows the fly line across, and that's how I'll do it through the winter months a lot of times if I'm fishing those really slow edges. I'll use a shorter, uh, you know, a more buoyant line with a shorter tip and a heavy fly. And the presentation is more uh, vertical, whereas in the fall, I'm fishing at a long, slowly descending angle, you know. So that's that's my answer. You know, That's a great description. Long wind. Because I, I really think a lot of time, at least for some of the water I fish and some of, I know some of our small rivers have this, where you don't have this big expanse of consistent depth water you need to almost get down in this pocket and a heavy fly can do it because tips only get you so far right right and And you need time for tips right you need time for them to sink and space and so a lot of times you have to go to heavy fly which isn't as fun to cast maybe but (laughs) it's fun to catch fish on right right in the winter i take what i can get i mean i just want the the tug so um, and a lot of times I'm fishing really pretty short cast stuff in the winter. There's logistical reasons for that. A lot of times your gear is iced up, um, so you don't want to cast far, but it's also because of the nature of the slow water is restricted to a very small part of the river. Our winter water levels are frequently pretty low, so you're not you're just sim- not casting very far a lot of times, and, and to, it's more productive to not cast far, so... Uh, so, anyways, uh, that's that's how that presentation comes in. We did have a question about your patterns varying in size depending on season. Mm-hmm. And I remember your DVD you did, uh, Striking Steel, if I remember correctly, where you actually talk about swinging small, I mean, we're talking nymph size flies sure. even. So, you know, seasonally, water temperature wise, uh, you know, we're just trying to look inside. Sure. A so, guy's brain that's on the water every day. So. If I can get away with a big fly, you know, so the steel had come in in the fall, and they don't uh, they have a whole lot of inhibition at the time. The water's warm, but there's not very many of them. So you use, I use a lot of times a pretty big fly because that, in theory, the fish can feel and sense from farther away, and because they're not very smart at that time, they'll come charging across the river from 40 or 50 feet away and eat it. Um, but that's different as you head into the winter. You know, you run into this problem where you have to sink the fly and you have to keep it down through the entire swing, and that's where smaller and heavier flies come into play. Um, and we have become more and more successful with smaller flies over the years, just learning um, learning things. But then not only that, but then you start heading towards spring, and then you just have the generally smaller, you know, you start by mid-February, if we have a warming trend, then the salmon fry will start hatching, and that becomes a primary food source. I mean, there's a lot of them. Uh, and and so uh, even if we're using basically the same pattern, we'll just kind of shrink it down. Like, for example, one of the flies we commonly use in the fall is a Halloween leech, and that's, you know, two, to th- two inches long, maybe a little longer. But in the springtime, that exact same fly will work just great, but it might only be an inch long. Um, but it'll have the exact same color scheme. And you'd think in the spring that would be different because a lot of those are dropback fish and they will eat big fly, but yet they're gorging on those little minnows. So even though it's not the same color as that minnow, it's the same shape. So, 
And they like the razzle dazzle. So, anyways, <laughs> I like the razzle dazzle. <laughs> uh, this this could be an entire video on its own. I'm sure. Uh, will you talk very briefly about your leader length? Sure. Uh, that's that's another good question. Um, and you know, you know, you can't say you know you just got to book a trip. You know, <laughs> I mean, that's okay. We'll allow it. <laughs> so, if you booked a trip, for example, if you fished with in um, October, November, December, kind of the standard steelhead period, where the water temperature is at least warmish or kind of moderate, you know, we'd almost always have a straight three to four foot, you know somewhere between 10 and 15 pound liter, usually towards the 15 end, unless the waters were really clear or were presenting really slow. Um, but in the winter, uh, as things go to that kind of shorter, more vertical presentation, uh, a lot of times what you'll do is you'll actually use a much longer leader and it's tapered pretty heavily towards the butt and it goes down typically to 10 pound, for example. It's a little bit lighter because initially what's happening is you cast that out and sometimes you might stack a mend into it to get it down. And that leader kind of buys time so that that fly can kind of sit there for a second and sink to the bottom. You get it to nick the bottom and that's when you lower the rod tip into that little faster water and it starts to swing the fly across. And hopefully that's when a fish, you know, eats, eats it. So that's uh, when they definitely will eat it. Yeah. <laughs> it's all about <laughs> need the confidence, right? <laughs> Can't go wrong. So um, kind of kind of the base gist of that is three to four feet leader whenever you're under kind of normal steelhead fishing conditions. If you're swinging flies, if your swinging flies is restricted to the fall, then just keep it simple, three to four feet straight. Um, but if you fish in the winter, that's when you might lengthen it to eight feet, for example. Um, and buy yourself a little time to get that fly down in the sh sh soft edges. So That's great. And the next question from, from Adam, who I know is brand new to swinging flies and caught his first steelhead this fall. Pretty exciting. So you, we missed the thumbs up. We'll give him one more. So there, there we go. <laughs> uh, he was asking, if, I think you kind of answered it there, but he's asking if you're looking for consistent speed or if you ever change speeds throughout a swing. For me, um, you know, that's a, that's an interesting question. I, usually you don't think too much about the actual speed. You're kind of at the mercy of the river, uh, depending on what your river is flowing like. But um, you're choosing the speed of the water, for example, uh, in the fall, you can fish pretty much anywhere a steelhead lives, but then you kind of slow down and during the normal kind of October, November, uh, you start slowing down to what we consider to be walking speed water and you just kind of know it when you see it. Uh, and in that case, the fly comes across pretty evenly. Um, but in the winter, uh, there's kind of a mix between the beginning of the presentation a lot of times is very slow. And all you're really trying to do is you're trying to get that steelhead to just wake up long enough to move off the bottom and kind of move towards your fly. And once they start moving towards your fly, then if it speeds up, that's okay because they're committed at that point and they're going to eat it. So, um, But it, it really has more to do with the speed of the water than the speed of your presentation. Um, generally speaking, uh, I'm not somebody who's throwing downstream men's hardly at all into fishing. I'm not trying to intentionally speed the fly up. In general, I'm trying to keep it at a steady speed or, if anything, slow it down. So yeah, I hope that answers the question. That's great. And I feel I feel kind of bad for – I think you've been typecast, Kevin, because Kevin does so much more than just swing flies for steelhead. And you've been a really good – educator i feel yeah. like advocate for for people becoming um you know just knowledgeable anglers and understanding where they're fishing and it's been it's been awesome uh you're overly generous as usual with your information so yeah and, we really appreciate that yeah you present the information in a way that's very easy to understand so thank you appreciate that yeah i mean there's there's a lot of there's a fair amount of scientific info sure. out there definitely but you've kind of served as that that go between to make it friendly for anglers to consume and, and be better, which is, 
I don't know. That's exciting. I hope uh, I hope you know how much everybody appreciates it. So we're just trying to That's get really you a blush, nice. really. So <laughs> uh, let's see. We're gonna start wrapping this up. We've hit the hour and a half mark, uh, which. <laughs> I think uh Kevin I don't know if you you still probably have to hit the road tonight yeah, knowing you good. but um thank you so much everyone yeah. for tuning in if you haven't done so yet think about subscribing down below that lets you know whenever these these videos go up we're going to keep doing these we got a whole another month of them in fact we have another guy who who is uh known to handle a two-handed rod uh Jeff Hubbard next week Ooh, so pretty choice, excited yeah. about that uh, I'm going to reach out to him here in the next few days, and we'll get some details sorted out, which is always fun. Mm-hmm. Kevin, will you quickly tell us what's the best way to get a hold of you? I mean, I'm sure there's people out there interested in that and uh, maybe looking at booking a trip, I hope. so. Ooh, I'd love to have you. Uh, I'm at FeenstraGuideService.com um, or FeenstraOutdoors.com. They both come to the same thing, kind of a long story. But when I was building one website, I added a second uh, anyways, either way works. Uh, Kevin or info at Feenster Guide Service. That's my email address, FeensterGuideService.com, I should say. Um, and I'm uh, pretty easy to track down and I'd love to hear from you. So, um, and don't, don't forget, uh, maybe give Kevin a follow on Instagram. I promise worthwhile. you will not regret it. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's uh, yeah. There's a lot I can learn, I think, from this. <laughs> Buy more toys is what <laughs> oh, I think what Kevin said. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. So um, hope to see everyone next week uh, for Jeff Hubbard. Uh, we got a few more things coming up. We've got, if you haven't heard, Spooled, our podcast has launched. We're going to be recording some more episodes this week. We have the Midwest Fly Fishing Expo coming up in March. 12th That's going to be fun. Uh, Come see us as long as the show continues. We will be there. And then the Fly Fishing Film Tour Yay. is coming back to Traverse City. So tell everyone you know we'd love to have you at the Opera House. That's, again, in March. Uh, I'll play the promo here. And one quick note, apologies. I did not I did not have time to make a new graphic. So there's some, uh, there's some overlap information here. And uh, you're going to... You're going to see a promo for Kevin again. Apologies, but it's Jeff Hubbard That's next fine. week. Anything to add, Joe, the Goose King? Uh, it's so nice to have uh, stuff coming back online like the Expo and the Film Tour. And uh, keep in touch with conservation. Have a great week, everybody, and see you next Wednesday. Thanks again to Kevin. Uh, thanks, thanks, everyone. Thank and we will see you next week. <laughs>